Neil, we've spoken previously about you know top five books to get into hacking. Uh, we've we've spoken a lot about hacking, but we've we've kind of emphasized red team type stuff. And I've had a lot of questions from people saying, okay, but what about the blue team? So let's talk about blue team. Do you have books like top five books, top three books that you would recommend someone to read if they want to go down the blue team uh, route? One hundred percent. And and I came prepared with Good. said books right here, um, anticipating this this conversation with you. And so um. There's a there's a lot of reasons why you know I, I try to I try to talk about the reasons why books are important um, you know whenever we do these top five books and so I just want to kind of I want to kind of start off with with one of my favorites right which is the the threat intelligence handbook um, threat intelligence is an incredibly important aspect of any cybersecurity organization because it's it's about getting you know information to decision makers fast so they can make decisions about what they can do in their organization. But one of the biggest misconceptions inside of a cybersecurity organization is that, oh, well, I pay that from a third party like Record a Future or Threat Connect or somebody like that. And so therefore, you know, I don't really need to have a cyber threat intelligence organization. And I think that that's a misnomer. And that's why I think books like this are important. I'm trying to produce, reduce the glare here on this one. I think that's, that's okay. why that's why this book is important is because this book actually helps you understand how to build a lightweight threat intelligence organization inside of your company that helps you to achieve that objective of actually trying to bring rapid decision making through intelligence to the CISO, to your 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 director of security operations, to the business even. Um, and so so that's that's definitely one um, one that's you know you at, you asked about blue team. But there's one that I want to, um, I think every blue teamer should definitely know. Um, and, and, and it may seem, it may seem weird for your viewers, but it's this one right here. This one's called the risk business, right? It's the risk business. What CISOs need to know about risk-based cybersecurity. So why is this important? Um, you know, it, I, I go back to conversations that I've had with CISOs on my stream, right? Where the, the biggest problem that they have isn't the amount of malware attempts that are coming into an organization. It's how do you convey to the business that they need to care about why they should put antivirus onto something? Why having Windows NT on a manufacturing line is a bad idea? Why, you know, they should do some of the common security practices that we talk about? And a lot of that comes in understanding the risk-based approach that comes to cybersecurity. And why is this important from a blue team perspective? Let's say that you're a, map, you're, you're a SOC analyst and you see two EDR, endpoint detection response alerts, that fire on your SIM, your security information event management system, like a Splunk or something like that. You see two alerts that fire at the same time. You have to make a decision, right? Because you're only one person. Which alert do you work first? How do you weigh both of those alerts so that you know that this alert is more valuable than this alert? And that doesn't come from the severity ratings of the alert. That comes from the risk to the organization. And so I think blue teamers need to have a good, solid risk focus to understand what's important to the CISO so that they know what's important to work from an incident response perspective. So that's why I'm a fan of this book. Now, Neil, I'm going to bring the level down because I always like to do that. So yeah. if anyone's watching now and you know, you're know you not interested in this section, then just skip to this timestamp to get the next book. But Neil, just can you give us like a short overview? Like what's a CISO? Um, like just, uh, we, we'll do a whole separate video on this, but like what's their responsibility and who, who the people below them and why do we care? as a blue team type person. Absolutely. So a CISO is a chief information security officer. So in the hierarchy of a cybersecurity organization, this is the is the man or the woman who owns the responsibility for all cybersecurity strategy across any company. Whether it's red team, whether it's blue team, whether it's policies, right? Whatever the case is, if it's cybersecurity related, 
this is probably going to be your boss. Now in smaller organizations, you probably have like a director of information security. And all that is, is just a CISO light. Um, but it's still basically a CISO. Um, and so, you know, they have a pretty, you know, let's put it this way. Um, for those who don't know how businesses work, right? Um, the chief executive officer, the C CEO, right? The chief financial officer, CFO, you could have the CHRO, which is the chief human resources officer. Those are what's referred to as fiduciary responsibilities, meaning that because they report to the SEC or they report to the board, if they do something illegal, you as a person can actually sue, um, you know, those, those C-level executives because of that. The CISO is the person who owns the responsibility for cybersecurity. And while it's not a fiduciary role, um, they do report directly to the board. And typically, whenever there is a um, cybersecurity breach or one of these high profile breaches happen, the board typically fires them. And that that's what makes CISOs one of the most stressful jobs in our industry um, is that if there is literally almost any cybersecurity event that happens in an organization, it's going to fall squarely on their shoulders. Um, and so, you know, they have a vested interest in making sure that their blue team um, has the tools, the techniques, and the capabilities to defend, to protect that 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 network defense and that 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 organization's defense, um, and, and make sure that the the people who are who are in that company are adhering to those security policies. So, it's, so that 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 book helps you understand how they think or what's exactly. important to them, which means that you become more valuable because if you, if you can talk their language, if you understand what's important to them, that's going to help you get. A better progression in your career is that kind of what we're saying yeah that is a hundred percent what we're saying and and thank you for so pu for putting it so eloquently um because i do think that that's a problem that we have in our industry is that we have a lot of you have a lot of technical people on your channel right we've talked you know you, i've yeah. seen your videos you do a lot of technical stuff but there's a long road between doing that technical stuff and then helping that that singular leader that you have in your cybersecurity organization convert all that awesome knowledge that you have in your head into something that matters to the business. And that's, if we were to talk about the single biggest problem that exists in our career, our, our industry, that is it, is that we as an industry fail to communicate to the business, why should you patch this box? Why are passwords important? Why should you even do a red team operation? Why should you even do a penetration test? Right. One of the things that when people talk about getting into the ethical hacking space, you know, you know, they think that like everybody just wants penetration tests. <laughs> if you if you actually go to most Fortune 100 companies, they struggle to get one pen test a year. Right. They struggle to get one pen test a year. And, and it's because there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings that happen because we have failed to communicate the value of a penetration test at the tactical level, all the way up to something like even, even the CISO level. So, so I think this book, and, and yeah, I think you said it well, this book helps you to start to think about what's important to a CISO so that you can start to frame your mind better about how you make that penetration test important to them. And that helps you in your career because if you can frame, it's like selling, you've got mm -hmm. to sell yourself. Um, I, the way I look at it is um, if you can, if you someone who can articulate why something's important, you make their job easier, which means they want to keep you on their team. So if you get offered someone out, somewhere else, they might want to pay you more to keep you. They'll more likely uh, give you a better job because mm -hmm. you know you're valuable to the team. Having technical technical skills without a personality or without out being able to communicate is kind of not that valuable. It, it, Obviously, it, there are edge cases, but I mean in it, general, yeah. There there are there are edge cases, and you're 100 percent right. And and I'm a, I'm an example of this. And I'll and I'll and again I'll kind of I'll bear my soul out there for for folks who are coming up in this industry to to hear from. I've been technical my entire life, right? And even to this day, even sitting where I sit in in a lot of cybersecurity organizations, um, you know, I still you know do a lot of the you know I do my own honeypot deployments. I I talk about this stuff on stream. I I do my own OSINT. You know, when I run my company, I do penetration testing, right? I still try to put my hands on keyboard to maintain my technical stuff. But I can tell you that CISOs don't reach out to me because of my technical prowess. As a matter of fact, I've had CISOs get actually really turned off by how technical I am. The reason that CISOs reach out to me and the reason that I have such a good rapport with a lot of the CISOs that I work with is because I can take those technical concepts 
and I can talk directly to the CIO. I can talk directly to the CFO. I was, I'm, I'm working with one organization right now, um, and, and they've had me on um, a multi-month engagement to talk to everybody at their executive leadership team. And when I talk about everybody, we're talking about the CEO of a billion dollar brand, right? It's a Fortune 100 company, you know, chief legal counsel, right? You know, SVP of supply chain, right? All these high level executives, but I don't talk to them about the technical stuff. But what I can do is I can take the technical stuff that, that, that I know about and that I, I've learned over the years and I can break that stuff down and I can communicate to them at, at, at a language that they understand. And that's the value that comes from that is being able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, I don't want to hop on this too long, but I think it's important, you know, develop your technical skills because you have to have that. Mm -hmm. But don't forget about your soft skills. Don't forget about um, your communication skills. And I think a lot of this, Neil, I don't know if you agree, but I think a lot of this also depends on how old you are. If you're just breaking in, <laughs> you know, the technical stuff is generally where a lot of us start, like mm -hmm. hardcore technical stuff. But as you get old, like we are, as you get older, <laughs> you realize that as you grow up in a business, you often leave technical behind and you become more business orientated. So I think if you're starting out, if, you, if you're if 18, and see if you agree with me, but if, you, if you're 18 years old and you want to be in this game for 20 years, don't just think here and now. Mm -hmm. Think about where you're going and develop skills that will help you, you know, in the long term. Well, and I think that that's that's what that's what I would like to impart upon you know the the folks who are coming up in the career field, whether you're 18 coming into the career field or whether you're 40 coming into the career field, right? Is, um, you know, everybody wants to do the cool technical stuff, and I want you to do the cool tech. I want you to innovate this industry like nobody has seen in 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 our lifetime, but I want you to learn the personal skills early on because I think our career field would transform so much faster. And I think we would get a lot of the um, the things that we all want out of the career field, like getting rid of legacy operating systems, right? Getting rid of crappy passwords, right? Forcing multi-factor authentication on all your login stuff. I think we would get to those points faster if we didn't suck at communicating. And so I would just want people who come into this career field to focus as much on those soft skills as they do on their technical skills. So Neil, what about your third book? Yeah, absolutely. So the third book and kind of um, uh, carrying on with the the intelligence um, part of it is intelligence driven incident response, right? This is an incredible book because most people think that incident response is just like, hey, there's an alert that pops up and I'm just going to like tell my EDR to go forward, right? Or I'm going to go have the help desk wipe the box, right? Or something like this. But when we talk about making informed decisions, especially in the realm of incident response, especially when you've got alert fatigue, right? Um, having an intelligence driven approach to your incident response helps you make more informed decisions and helps you build out your incident response process so that it's more efficient and more effective. Um, you can also see this one. I've still got tabs in this one where I've actually used this book to, um, to actually build a lot of the, the capabilities inside of most cybersecurity organizations. So this book is, is incredibly powerful, um, from that regard. And it's, it's from, from David, from your favorite, you know, author O'Reilly. Of course. <laughs> um, I think we mentioned this one on our top five books for for ethical hacking, but it's it's we worth did, yeah. A, yeah it's worth another honorable mention here, right? Which is the Blue Team Handbook, right? The Incident Response Edition, and this is what you'll find. Like you know, you see incident response, you know, intelligence driven incident response. You see, you know, incident response edition on the the Blue Blue Team Handbook, right? That's because whether you're a SOC analyst one or whether you're a threat hunter. This is probably what most of your job entails is looking for cybersecurity threats and responding to incidents, right? Even as a threat hunter, imagine that you're on a threat hunt and you, um, you, you encounter a piece of malicious software during your threat hunts. That's going to quickly turn into an incident response engagement. And so that's why you see so many books focused in on threat and incident response is because that is, you know, that's one of those 10 mile deep things that we talk about where you can get um, you can get pretty in depth in terms of the knowledge that you, that you use. And so this is a fantastic book. Again, the, the thing that I love about this, if you saw this from David's video, right, is that it includes tons of just quick reference commands so that if you're sitting on a console doing incident response type work and you need to know, like we can open this up and say NMAP scripting engine, right? Um, and you've got a ton of commands here that just, um, um, you know, uh, you know, help you you know, figure out how to run in map and, and how to do uh, how to do the MF scripting engine in your incident response process. So huge fan of this book.
And then the last one, and again, something that's probably a little thicker than a lot of the books that you'll see, like, you know, you can always tell, like, this is a Neil style book show, right? We've got, we've got four incredibly skinny, tiny books because that's what my attention span is, right? And then I've got... <laughs> For a lot of us, yeah. <laughs> I, then I've always got one really big book, which is like, I don't really want to read this, and God, this this pains me to read a book this big, but the amount of data that's in this threat modeling book is insane, right? And so threat modeling right here. Um, designing for security, right? Um, when we talk about threat models, you not every company's threat cases are exactly the same, right? A financial services company um, cares about different things than a healthcare company. And this is why threat modeling is important. Threat modeling helps you as an incident responder, understand what your threat profile is. It helps you as a threat hunter, build out your threat hunt cases. It helps you as a forensicator, as somebody who does uh, forensics, understand um, what, the, what the threat that you're looking for is and what maybe some of the artifacts are that are associated with that threat. Or you know, if, if exfiltration is part of that threat model, helps you look for other indicators as part of your forensics investigation um, around data exfiltration. And so doing threat modeling and understanding threat modeling, I think is very, very key to uh, some of the blue team uh, topics. And so um, those are my five books um, that, that I would highly recommend for blue team. But you know, you know, I'm going to ask you the difficult one. Okay. Go for it. Haven't got a lot of money. Yep. Typical question. Which three? Which three? Which first, three? First, first, First one, like which is the very first book that you recommend I start this, with? This guy right here, Blue Team yep. Handbook, Instant Response okay. Edition. That's the number one book that I number get. Number one, yeah. Yeah, number one. Number two, Threat Intelligence Handbook, right? Yep. Again, super easy. This book, does this one have a price in it? I don't think any of my books have a price in it. This one should be pretty cheap too, right? But again, small book, easy to read, quick, easy reference. Third book, because it is O'Reilly, because it is key to what we do, <laughs> intelligence driven instant response. If you only could pick three, so this one, this one's probably the most expensive book. This one actually, see, this is one that still has the the ISBN on the back of it. This one's fifty nine ninety nine, or at least the, the sticker on it is fifty nine ninety nine. So this is probably the most expensive book of the, all all three of them. This one is actually so this one right here. This one is actually put out by Recorded Future, um, and so this one's actually probably cheap, if not relatively free. You could probably get this one from RecordedFuture.com actually. Um, I think that may have been where I got this one from. I'll have to figure that out and get that one to you. And then this one, this one's going to be pretty cheap as well. I don't see the price on this one as well, but this one should be pretty cheap. So if you had, to, if your money was tight, right, these two are going to be pretty cheap to get. This one will be your most expensive investment right here on this guy. So Neil, I mean, we'll probably have to cover this in a lot of detail in a separate video, but I just want to add this to to this video. Okay, so those are the books that I would look at getting. Um, another question that often comes up is, okay. I see a lot of training for for red team like OSCP, et cetera, et cetera. Are there any certifications or any training paths for blue team? There are, there are. And, and you know, I, I was recently having this, I was actually having this conversation last night in my discord with some, with, a, with an individual who was asking a very similar question, right? Because, um, you know, there, there currently isn't the OSCP for blue team. That currently doesn't exist. Um, and SANS only has, I mean, SANS has some blue team courses, but they don't have a career path for blue team. Um, this is why I point people to, you know, you know, to I and E and, and kudos to I and E for lowering the price again um, um, on their on their stuff. But, you know, even though PTS is kind of their free offering that they that they um uh, put out there for, for, for everybody to see, once you get past that PTS and you get access to their entire course catalog, they have amazing content on the blue team side. They have an instant handling course. They have a threat hunter course. They have a malware analysis course. And those are part of very specific career progression paths in the blue team space. Um, um, you know, that exist out there. Um, and so I, I don't think that, I, I think that, there's probably a sign on the horizon, um, a, a vacuum in the market space for somebody to do the OSCP of blue team content. Um, I think we start to, I see you know, the videos that you and I are doing, um, you know, I, I wonder if that's indicating a shift because here recently within the last couple of weeks, try hack me 
started to release their blue team labs on try hack me um range force um who is a sponsor of the the, the cyber and security stream um they do uh um blue uh, primarily blue team labs they have some red team labs um but they they focus on blue team technology where they have labs with splunk um where you can actually go get hands-on with splunk and so when we talk about the blue side of this we're starting to see that that same hands-on principle that you and i talked about for the red team side is is completely applicable on the blue team side because you can go somewhere like range force and you can take their Splunk labs, you can take their Carbon Black labs, you can take their Elastic labs, and you can actually get hands-on with technologies that are on the blue side um, in most Fortune companies. And you can actually put that stuff on your resume that you have hands-on experience with Splunk because of the experience that you've got inside of Range Force. And, and I think people need to recognize that that experience in this space very much counts you know, heavily on your resume. Yeah, I mean, that's what's going to be my next question. Okay, so I've read these books. Um, there's some courses I can take, but these, can you just mention them again? How do I get experience and what can I put on my resume or CV to prove to companies that I actually know what I'm talking about? So so one of the things I will harp on every video that you ever ask me that, and something I harp on every single solitary stream when people ask me that is take all the free stuff first, Okay. There's so much free stuff that's out there. And so this is why I harp on going to INE and starting up the, start the starter pass. Take the free stuff that's out there. But you can also go to Try Hack Me. They have some free blue team labs that are out there um, for you to do. They're, they're starting to expand their, their blue team content. Go to um, go to cyberdefenders.org. Go to Security Blue Team. Um, you know, those are great places where you can get free stuff to work on as well. Go to Range Force right and go sign up for the community edition of range force because range force is going to have blue team stuff that you can do now that's all the free stuff right when we start talking about okay you have to make a pricing decision is i'm going to preempt this question from david before he before he puts <laughs> me in the hot seat again you know if you've got to make a pricing decision right you've only got a little bit of money to invest in this is where i would go to range force versus a try hack me. And 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 I and and I want you to to hear me out on this one. The Range Force Labs have two biggest benefits that I think are key for your CV or for your resume. First and foremost, you get real security blue team technology. They have Splunk Labs, they have Elastic Labs, they have Carbon Black Labs. They have labs with technology that Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 1000 companies are putting into their cybersecurity defense strategy. And so on your CV, your resume, under experience, you can legitimately put, I have Splunk experience here, and you can get that from Range Force. I have carbon black experience. You got that from Range Force. Um, you, uh, um, you, know, you know, that means that you can fill almost that SOC analyst level one role. The second piece to Range Force that I think Range Force offers as an advantage over a Try Hack Me or some of these other ones is they have acclaim um, verified badges for their SOC Analyst 1, SOC Analyst 2, SOC Analyst 3, and Threat Hunter courses. And so if you have to put the money into something, I would say put the money into Range Force because then you're actually going to be able to put real world technology on your resume and you're going to get badges you know almost to the you know to, to something that's that's a certification equivalent right that you could put on your resume that shows that you have that hands-on experience um and, and so that's that that's my take on it i think you can still achieve it with try hack me if you're in the try hack me ecosystem you've been doing the try hack me red team side for a while and you you venture on over into the um the blue team side you've already got a paid subscription and things like that to try hack me still do it with try hack me Still put that stuff on your CV um, and your resume as well, um, and, and I think that that stuff's you know equally as valuable as when we talked about it in our red team videos. But that's why I'm a huge fan of the Range Force stuff is that they you know they're going to give you stuff that if I'm a hiring manager and I see Splunk on your resume, it's instantly going to click that you've got hands-on experience with probably one of the sims that I'm using inside of my infra infrastructure.